So uh, the topic of this presentation is React Tip and Tricks. Uh, I've changed this a little, for a little bit, but uh, the main goal of this presentation is to cover main anti-patterns and best practices in React. Maybe not all of them, but uh, that one that I think uh, ones that are most important. Uh, okay, let me introduce myself. Uh, I am Maxim Plavinsky. Uh, I work, I'm working at SoftServe for years already, and uh, I'm a Web UI software engineer with PHP background. And uh, currently, the biggest challenge on my project is to migrate from 15 version to 16 React. I mean, and you can find me on in Twitter and Max Bluff. Uh, okay, so here, yeah, and so agenda uh, React anti patterns, best practices, tools, and questions and answers. Okay, let's talk about anti patterns. Uh, well, most of them are uh, like bad practices that uh, may imp uh, may affect your software system and performance. So uh, I've decided to review a couple of them, bint and row functions and components, uh, using indexes in key prop, set state is a sync, just spread attributes, inheritance in React, file structure, and bloated components. Sorry, here. So, why, no words. Can't move this, why? Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, the first one is bint and arrow function. You can see an example, for example, uh, when uh, developers want to bind some action handler in, in render function. And uh, this is a bad practice. The same, uh, works for uh, arrow functions. Uh, why this bad? That uh, uh, every time you uh, bind your method or uh, you create an arrow function, the new function comes, and so React React framework can't understand uh, is this a new function or uh, is this uh, the same or not because uh, it compares objects by references. So every time bin creates a new a new function. How to avoid this? How to make a solution? Well, uh, you one of the solutions uh, that we use on our project is to bind all this stuff in constructor. Also, you can uh, use, uh, you can define your method as uh, error function. In that case, uh, is it, it's, it's under the hood, is the same like bind your method uh, in constructor and no performance penalties here. Okay, let's move to the next one. Using indexes in key prop. Uh, uh, React uses key prop for reconciliation and uh, by that key, uh, React compares uh, uh, if something changes in your, uh, for example, collection structure. And uh, you can't use uh, uh, index, for example, of array, array index as a key uh, prop because uh, it's not stable, it's not, uh, well, it can change. If you add a new component, the whole collection can be reshuffled and you lose your real index. And uh, when React sees the same components, React uh, consider them the same and uh, put a warning in your console, maybe you, you saw this. What also, you can't use timestamp and random numbers. Uh, what are requirements for key prop? Stable, predictable, and uh, and uh, something else I forgot. Well, so basically, what we can use for key uh, database IDs or generated hash. Hash can be a composition of ID plus name, for example, if name can be unique. And something like that, it's better to use. Uh, is the uniqueness of the key should be in a scope of this uh, collection. If you render your component uh, twice, uh, the key should be the same. It's the main idea. Okay, let's move to the next one. 
set state is a sync. Consider you have a code like this somewhere. For example, set state on line three and set state on line seven. It's not ideal, but for example, uh, it won't work as expected. And you in line eight, you won't, you won't uh, receive the updated state value. And also you can look at line two, uh, you can't mutate uh, uh, state uh, directly by just using uh, uh, assignment uh, because uh, it may lead to React doesn't understand that something changes uh, in state and uh, just not re-render, just not apply the changes. And uh, as for state, as for uh, object that goes to set state function, uh, this is uh, should be avoided in that case. Of course, you have uh, full uh, callback, but uh, it's better to use uh, uh, updater function. This goes as a first argument of the set state method, uh, set state function. This guarantees, for example, that in line six, you will receive a state that was updated on line three. This is some only guarantee. And that's it. Quite easy, and it's a recommendation from React guys. So don't forget about this. Okay, the next one: JSX spread attributes. Uh, don't do this like on line four, uh, spreading your props just on a HTML uh, tag uh, because it may lead to assigning uh, not valid, non-valid uh, attributes. That, mean, that means that HTML can be non-valid and this may leads to also performance issues. It's better to assign like here, it's better to assign something uh, predictable that you really want. And uh, let's move back, oh sorry. Let's move back. Uh, here on line six also you, you may spread your props uh, on your component, but uh, this is like implicit that data transfer, uh, you may, this is a sign of that you want to put all your props, but uh, in one day it may come that uh, uh, you don't need all of these props or, or may or you may uh, put uh, not necessary props and this also leads to performance issues and it's not a clean code I would say so uh, it's better to assign your data directly to some prop that you can handle and cover with for example, uh, prop types, checking, and something, or, and also assign valid attributes to your HTML tags. Okay, next one, inheritance in React. This is, I would say, uh, specific case. Uh, don't do, uh, well, prefer composition, of course, over inheritance, uh, and if you want to make your some specific component of uh, um, made of some parent component, for example, basic component. It's better to use composi composition like in line 15, then uh, extending the basic component and uh, like uh, hijacking render and extending this render like in line uh, line nine. Uh, this is that was. Uh, big discussion in the React community. And of course they decided to use composition and uh, a special case like it's called specialization when you just extend some basic component with some stuff, props in that case. Okay, let's move further. Uh, file structure. And now it's a big challenge on the big uh, projects to, to, to find Correct, correct way how to structure files and uh, general suggestions are please avoid uh, deep directory nesting because it, it becomes harder to maintain all this stuff and also it, it's, it looks like mish, mishmash and all these files and so on. So it, and of course it's hard to import all the stuff from some component. And also, uh, 
I would suggest is that keeping every component, each component in a separate file, it's also like anti-pattern because if you have a chance to keep uh, several components uh, tightly coupled, I would say that you know, that are uh, uh, nowhere that are not uh, can can't reuse somewhere else. So it's it's okay to put them in one file, and that's it. But uh, not in one component. It's better. I mean, the code in keeping code in one component. It's better to use a lot of components, but uh, you can, you may store them in one file. Okay, but it depends. Yeah, on the project. And the question is how to structure your app project. You can group your files by features or by routes, routes, or group them by file type or mix of two. On our current project, we use mix of two. Uh, I'll tell you later a bit. Uh, okay, so grouping by feature by roads may look like this. When you uh, have, for example, some feature product and you put all your styles, API calls, test files, JS files inside one directory. Uh, it's good. It's it's wonderfully reusable. You can export all this stuff in one, one index.js file. And this is a good approach, I would say. And another, another type of grouping is grouping by file type. Uh, you can store your, uh, for example, styles uh, in one folder, directory styles and the components with components, API with API, and inside I would suggest to use uh, grouping by feature, for example. Uh, I think in our current project we use a mix of two. It's like uh, on the root, root level we, uh, we group by uh, file type, components, styles, APIs, actions, and so on. And inside, for example, components, we group them by features. Okay, and the next one, bloated components, the last one, empty patterns. Uh, what are these bloated components? I would say this is like a super component that, uh, that stores all business, some business logic from different um, components. I would say this, uh, I would say this violates violates a single responsibility principle, um, and also from a performance perspective, um, re-rendering of some child component may lead to re-render re rendering sorry of all siblings. So uh, here I would say key notes that. Uh, uh, if you use Redux, you should uh, connect your connect your component to the Redux uh, in a proper way, in the right place, uh, not on the the highest component. I would say this is like an anti pattern. Just uh, find the the best place that uh, relates to this single component, and also. Please split components by their responsibility. I know this is difficult, but uh, this may change responsibility, but uh, you should try. And this is like a general suggestion, like uh, when you're trying to decompose your big bloated component, try to find these responsibilities. Next step is gonna be, uh, let me move back. Uh, the next step is gonna be like create a sub render functions, uh, methods like line, line five. And then you can try to put all these render functions in the separate components. And be aware please of props drilling. Uh, it's like passing uh, props from a grandchild to, uh, for, sorry, from a grandparent from to their grandchild. It's so uh, like, uh, it's also considered an anti-pattern. It means that you uh, something doing something wrong. Okay, then the next topic is best practices. Uh, 
here we can review functional components, pure components, memo and, uh, and fragment, suspense and lazy, component will unmount, uh, uh, production build of React, webpack and others. Okay, let's move to the next, uh, to the first one, best practice. I would say a uh, functional component that came uh, in React 15 uh, and they became mature in React 16. Uh, this, is a, this is a very wonderful thing that we have nowadays. Uh, you, know, you no longer need these or bins that we discussed on the previous topic. Uh, it's easier to read them, to understand, and uh, they need less code to write, and, uh, and React guys promise to give performance boost for these functional components uh, in the future. And of, of course, you can use React hooks that came in React 16. This is a wonderful feature, I would say. So please, if you, if you uh, don't, don't use them, please consider them. Uh, pure component. Uh, pure component is a basic component in React, I would say. Uh, this component uh, implements uh, uh, should component update. Uh, method that make that makes a shallow comparison of your props and this may lead to performance improvement uh, in case when your props are not very you know, complex and not very nested uh, this component uh, will uh, filter your uh, unnecessary re-renders re i would say when you know when props has been changed uh, component is going to re-render. So this pure component uh, filter this out. So you, you will receive a performance boost here. And uh, of course, uh, there are some restrictions. Uh, please keep in mind that not to use side effects in pure components like uh, asynchronous calls, data, uh, writing to data, files, network, login this may lead to some unpredictable behavior i would say and this is like a general suggestion from your react guys okay memo react memo this is like a pure component but for functional components in that case you can cache your functional component um, cache by uh, props that you receive and uh, yeah, how how I see this cache? Uh, props are like keys, and uh, GSX is like values that's going to, to be returned after this recalculation. Calculation, and uh, there are some also restrictions for me memo. Uh, it's on uh, this memo uh, also as well as pure component. It compares uh, your props shallowly. So if you need some deeper uh, complex logic, use a uh, second argument of this memo is a function are props equal. So you may uh, use your own conditions of this shallow render, uh, shallow comparison. Please take a look at this. The next one is fragment. This is a cool feature, I would say, that uh, we used to, in React 15, we used to, uh, oh, we are still using uh, extra nodes, some div components, uh, div tags, sorry, div tags, just to group some uh, components or some items in, uh, in a render function. And, uh, when fragment came, you, now we can use uh, shortage of this fragment like these brackets in line two and line six. It's cool and also leads to performance improvement because uh, now uh, no extra nodes will be created. I mean, no divs or something. You know that to work with uh, to work with uh, working with uh, a DOM <coughs> is rather expensive. Okay, the next one is suspense and lazy. This another. This is another cool feature from uh, 
React 16. Now you can load your components on demand. Uh, this is lazy loading. Uh, and uh, while this component is being loaded, uh, all back may, may be presented to the user. Like in line six, you, you can just throw some spinner loading or something. And uh, why this is great that uh, you like, um, first of all, uh, if you use Webpack, Webpack can understand this lazy loading and can put this component to a separate chunk and then uh, load this chunk only with this bundle only um, on demand when you uh, when you go to some page or some somewhere so it's it's also good for caching and for good for splitting strategy Okay, the next one is component will unmount. Don't forget about this guy. Uh, when you do something in component deep mount, for example, uh, some you are adding some event listeners on DOM elements, or you are making some external calls, uh, requests, timers, setting timers, and something, you should do opposite operation in component will unmount. Uh, like in this example, uh, in line five, uh, code tries to send uh, some fetch, re some request, and uh, in in in, in a method component will amount uh, this request will, will be aborted uh, uh, just because when this component will be unmounted you no longer need this request. And this may lead, in opposite way, this may lead to performance uh, uh, lags. And uh, you know, sometimes React uh, push warning, like you can't do set state on a component that was unmounted or something like this. So in that case, you can just avoid this situation. Don't forget about this guy. Okay, production build. Uh, don't forget to use production build when you deploy some, uh, when you deploy your application on some environment. Uh, deploy uh, production builds are, uh, they are uh, smaller, they are optimized for production, no uh, warnings, I would say, no some details, so it's like minimized code. So it's, suggestion and of course uh, Chrome DevTools plugin can help you with this to identify whether the production build is being deployed was deployed or not in that case uh, it it alerts with a red color that and shows the pop-up that uh, page is using development build for example another uh, suggestion is uh, configure your webpack properly. Uh, as I said, you can use split chunks plugin for uh, for splitting your bundle on chunks or your code on chunks. And uh, in webpack in webpack three, there was uh, commons chunk plugin. And uh, also in webpack four, you can set up production mode. Uh, and this will minify your code and so on. It's like optimize your code for production. Uh, also, uh, you can use bundle analyzer plugin. This may look like this. Uh, if you use Webpack bundle analyzer library, uh, after each uh, build, Webpack will show you uh, like this uh, map, yeah, interactive map tree map with uh, a lot of uh, a lot of libraries that are uh, that are put on your bundles and you can uh, investigate uh, the size of your libraries and really understand is it necessary to use this library or not and you can define you can clean up your dependencies to find unnecessary dependencies, or you can optimize current dependencies. In this example, you can see that Lodash is huge, maybe 
a megabyte uh, library. It's better to use uh, Webpack plugin. It's called Lodash Webpack plugin that uh, will filter out uh, unnecessary utility functions that you don't use, but they are included in your code. So please keep in mind this stuff. And also, who uses Moment? Uh, those people understand pain of using this uh, library because it's really huge. And uh, please consider using Moment Locals Webpack plugin, for example. Uh, just to remove unnecessary locals from your, if you don't use, for example, some, I don't know, Chinese language, yeah, on your application, then you don't need uh, this lo local, yeah. And also Webpack can put hash, hashes to your chunks names, and this uh, will improve your caching strategy. Okay, the next one is profiling components. Chrome DevTools, it's a wonderful tool that, uh, that you may see in your Chrome browser or even in Opera you know, browser. It's also it looks similar. Uh, uh, I would say this uh, tool uh, really helps you to measure runtime performance, audit your uh, application, for example, like debugging. You can also use mobile simulation and identify memory leaks and so on. And many, many other things. And of course, inspect your DOM tree. Uh, this may look like this in your, if you are trying to uh, profile your runtime performance in your application, uh, this may look like this. It's from the first side, it may look rather difficult, but I would say this is a great and interactive uh, feature. And uh, Chrome DevTools also helps you to, to find some bottlenecks in your code, uh, like uh, it can highlight uh, some functions uh, that takes longer time to render. For example, in that case, uh, uh, Chrome DevTools show, showed this red triangle uh, function that were rendered, that the render of, of that functions take, took too long. <clears throat> and please keep in mind to use this and to be a master of this Chrome DevTools. It's a really great feature, yeah. Uh, and React DevTools. Uh, React 16, uh, 16, dot five, I guess, yeah. They um, shipped a new version of this uh, profiler. Uh, in the same way, like in the same way, like in Chrome DevTools, you can profile your runtime uh, performance and uh, find out which components uh, render too long. And uh, uh, for example, in that case, you can see that each bar green bar that you see, uh, this is like a component, and uh, you can see some statistics, uh, why this component was rendered, and uh, what props was were changed, and uh, how long it took for this component to be rendered. And uh, by clicking on this component, you can receive this information and uh, find out unnecessary re-renders, re and uh, maybe, uh, maybe improve your code in that case. Also, Profiler uh, has a lot has a lot of another advantages. So please keep in mind to use this guy. And also, uh, when you are trying to profile, uh, keep in mind, please keep in mind to slow down your CPU because if you are working on some top laptop and uh, it's, it may be difficult to, to find the bottleneck because it's really fast, fast. but uh, you can slow down your CPU, like throttle your CPU in six times, four times, just to simulate, um, for example, some mobile application, oh, sorry, device, mobile device, or some uh, 
some cheap laptop i don't know also it's very important to uh, to open your application in an incognito mode to disable browser extensions that can disturb your uh, application profiler and uh, you may consider using uh, profiling uh, production builds this, i think it is also useful because you can understand how your application behaves on, on real environment and to understand the real problems and to for example to, uh, to find out uh, some uh, non-functional requirements based on this uh, profiling and also please uh, disable function name mangling so that you can see in production build you can see uh, real function names component names just not f1 f2 but real function name uh, Web, webpack can help you with this i know okay the next one is throttling and debouncing event actions uh, sometimes uh, you, uh, when you for example in this example search input uh, sometimes it's not necessary to trigger uh, to fire uh, a lot of requests when you are when user types uh, something in search input and uh, by doing this you can delay all your requests uh, by using debounce function or throttle function they are quite similar but they have a little bit um, in that case it's better to use debounce uh, so please keep in mind just to 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 get uh, performance improvement and uh, not to load your server si server uh, with a lot of requests unnecessary requests and another stuff is client side rendering uh, client side rendering is a classic i would say single page application that receives almost empty html only with some scripts that should be loaded it loads the scripts uh, JS scripts styles, then parses them, executes them, and renders uh, all the content. Um, uh, this is how, uh, for example, create create React app works. Uh, first, uh, it has its own pros and cons. From pro that it, uh, it fast render uh, from after initial load, but con that this initial load it takes some time to be done and uh, it's cheaper it's cheaper to host and scale uh, but it's not seo friendly seo friendly uh, i know that google already can parse all your scripts but it's not perfect right now as i know and uh, in that case please consider server side rendering uh, server side rendering classic server side rendering is like for example in php when uh, backend returns uh, prepared html and uh, browser only renders all this stuff and in the context of react uh, this means that servers prepares some html and then react take this html and then uh, hydrate it with uh, actions and so on so part of that um, part of the time of rendering can be uh, put it on uh, uh, server side and uh, this is mostly of friendly because now and en uh, search engines can uh, uh, load real html and investigate it by their algorithms uh, it may it may be better performance and faster initial load but it can take uh, more time to for this page to be interactive this metrics call uh, time to interactive tti and um, uh, this is like a bit longer but in general this is faster than uh, client side rendering but it can it should be used uh, uh, it, properly because uh, these uh, server side renders uh, they load your server side um, quite a bit and uh, your, your application may respond longer for, for your 
for, for other requests. It's like because your server is busy you render by rendering your uh, with rendering your <coughs> HTML. <coughs> and so please consider SSR versus CSR uh, when you really need search uh, engine optimization, social media optimization, when somebody wants to share the link on your on your site, for example, and to see a beautiful pre some picture, yeah, how it's called, I don't know. And uh, so, and to keep in mind user experience, in case of CSR, user will receive uh, your, uh, real, real uh, HTML, real render faster. And the next suggestion is, uh, please keep in mind CSS animation uh, instead of GS animation in cases when you need some uh, not difficult, some one-shot transition or something. Uh, it's, it's easier for browser to, to do CSS animation in that case. <clears throat> uh, so please keep in mind CSS transactions and CSS animations. Uh, and the next one is uh, you can enable gzip compression on your web server. Uh, this may uh, reduce uh, uh, data transfer in size in, I don't know, maybe in eight or 10 times. So if your bundle is like in this example, uh, 400 kilobytes, then the real transfer data can be 50 kilobytes. It's, I think this is a huge, uh, improvement but keep in mind that uh, unzipping this uh, data on browser can take a little bit longer but i would suggest to you this you can uh, uh, use compression library on your for example node server and just use it as a middleware and tools uh, uh, as i said uh, Webpack is a great module bundler, so please keep in mind, but I think you can use other uh, module bundlers and uh, DevTools is a great debugging tool and to, invest, to in investigate your performance. Uh, SonarCube, this is continuous inspection uh, tool that uh, that tries to find some bad practices and small code in your uh, in your source code, yeah. And you can uh, hook this on your continuous integration and to, to see real-time real, real -time statistics what how your code quality goes. Uh, please keep in mind Lighthouse, this tool is really great and this can measure your, uh, audit your application and uh, sign some mark and uh, and can help you to understand where you should improve your, in what part of your application you should improve your code. Prometheus, this is uh, event monitoring and alerting software. It's also very useful to, to find out some spikes and some unpredictable behavior of your, for example, node requests and so on. Lodash, this is wonderful Swiss knife, I would say, um, with a lot of functions, utility functions that can help you uh, to develop good, a good quality code. And Prettier, this is a code formatter. And uh, ESLint, this is a linter, one of the most popular linters. So please keep in mind this stuff. And I guess that's it. Please, guys, ask your questions. Hi, Maxim. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks for your speech. So I had a question about your like. Uh, first of all, bad practices. So first, uh, firstly, you mentioned that uh, passing the props and destructing in, a, in like in line in a component that's a like, bad practice. So um, 
uh, should I explain you why? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, just I had a question. So if we are not passing the props, actually, uh, it's not this way, but you just destruct, destruct the. You had an example with destructing the uh, props. Of this, yeah, this guy. So mm -hmm. uh, in this case, if we uh, manually build uh, this object with uh, like filling the uh, filling all the ob like few objects with data that we need. Is this the same or it's the, the better? Uh, because the props with uh, we, we don't have, actually we can we can't uh, like receive any any props unexpected props in, in this case. But if you build manually the object and then uh, use like this, but not the props, these props, but these like params or anything. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. I understand your question. Thank you. And uh, I think that it depends, uh, is it implicit data transfer or not? Because if you store your uh, object that will be passed down uh, and you just spread it, I think this is okay. But uh, this may also lead to uh, where your colleagues may use this approach improperly and to forget to use uh, this build project, uh, sorry, object. So uh, you, you may take like a general suggestion not to do this. And I would suggest uh, as a rule, only pass uh, this uh, data uh, uh, explicitly. Just to see real data, yeah. Okay, thanks. And uh, the next question is, uh, you mentioned about the uh, structure in the project. So uh, when we, when, so we need to be careful when we like, put our code in the separate folders because it can build really nested structure. So, and it can prevent some, uh, some like issues with importing the imported that component. So uh, do we have any like uh, something similar with Angular when we in a TypeScript JS, we can pro uh, set like alias. So for example, if I want to import some uh, common used function that puts in the utils.js file, and this this JS file like based on uh, app slash util slash like uh, like common JS for example, and we can we can say so the path this path with uh, app dot at app slash uh, like util slash common we can hard code this guy and then just uh, provide the specific file or uh, in this folder. So in this case we just using this alias as like common files and uh, like our, for example, webpack will handle this path and replace with uh, full full path to this directory. So we will like work with app slash uh, common slash utils. Yeah. I understand what you're talking about. Thank you. Yeah, in React we have the same uh, aliases. Uh, aliases are great, but this is like a solving of this problem. Yeah. And uh, if you already have this problem, then you can use this aliases. And uh, uh, when you're, for example, a newcomer on a big enterprise project, you can just refactor all the all your code and changes your structure. But yeah, you just need to follow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I would say that uh, deep nesting. Uh, I would say more than three uh, nest uh, levels. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. This is like uh, difficult to recognize even when you open your project in, uh, for example, your Visual Studio or somewhere. And uh, it's, it's uh, became more complex to observe this structure yeah, and follow. And it, you know that we can, we can keep in mind up to five or seven things in, in one, one time. Yeah, but uh, if you have 10, uh, levels, yeah, it's difficult, yeah, to to understand. But uh, about file structure, it's a general suggestion. Just find your way and uh, follow your way and uh, write, put this in the documentation, yeah, in Confluence, for example, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, just follow your best practice. Okay, thanks. And probably the last question from my side. So about the best practices. So thanks for the mention about the passing the function in set state. So this that is really helpful. So I was trying to uh, also implement it this way. 
and uh, so I have the question. Firstly, if one, if I want to uh, change the state with, like, I have the very complex state, and I want to uh, like increase or like uh, update one of the properties of this state. So in our case, uh, so in your case, you uh, call the function uh, the delivered variable. So you want to update this, but if you want to, for example, state that uh, like load in process. So for example, I want to put from zero to 50%, for example. So, mm -hmm. and also I have the another 10 properties in our, in my state. So in this, in this case, it's better to like, um, probably it's the question how it's better to update this only one property in, in my big uh, state object. Oh, you mean how to, uh, well, uh, in that case, I would say that uh, you can update just only one property as I understand and uh, uh, just not to change others and uh, it, it, it won't be a problem I guess. Yeah, so I uh, just so basically what's what's the lecture what's the problem mm -hmm. under the hood of this case. So when we call the set state, the set mm -hmm. state provides us the state and props. Like and uh, you use the arrow function and it returns the object with uh, only one delivered variable. Mm -hmm. And in this case, uh, the set state function will merge the previous state and uh, this new with uh, only one delivered variable. So it's like we, so under the hood, it will call the object dot assign with state and this uh, like new object with delivered delivered variable. But, uh, but in like. Sometimes it's uh, cannot, so it's very straightforward way. So in this case, is it is it better to just to return in this error function like state that uh, like some property like equals uh, something, for example? Uh, honestly, I don't know. It's difficult to find out. I, I would suggest to get this offline. Yeah, you can ping yeah, me. Okay. Look at the code and find out the best way. Sure, sure, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for answers. Uh, any more questions, guys? Okay, I see somebody have to go. Uh, maybe me. Hello. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, um, was thinking about <clears throat> lazy loading. Do you know, is there any kind of prefetches components before you go into the page where it will be needed or it's that they're loading, <laughs> loaded once uh, you open, you know, appropriate page? Yeah. Because uh, I saw, like I tried <laughs> view next, like several days ago and I saw that there's some kind of prefetching, you know. Mm -hmm. So maybe here we will have something similar. Well, the whole prefetching is like breaks the whole idea of this. Basically. No, not not the wall. You know, <laughs> it's like I guess there is some kind of tree maybe, and when you load <coughs> a component on our page, mm -hmm. uh, it can maybe analyze, you know, links or something like that and define what could be opened. I don't know how it's working, you know, under the hood in Vue.js. <coughs> mm -hmm. just, just, just interested, you know. Uh, well, if you need something, yeah. Uh, I would suggest just to uh, load this stuff somewhere, another place. Or maybe it's handled by React. I don't know. Uh, I'm not aware about this thing. Uh, maybe, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Okay.